Hello, welcome to The Long Road. I'm your host, Chris Roberts. I'm back after a long summer out on the um, long road. I've been um, compiling uh, my mileage, I think, so far. I've a little bit more than 9,000 um, miles during this summer. Um, <clears throat> I was able to go down to Georgia with my two granddaughters, and um, they're happy. We stopped at um, a total of 16 national parks. My oldest granddaughter went to 13, 14 of them. My youngest granddaughter went to 12 of them. And I was able to take two of my grandsons to two other ones. And um, <clears throat> my daughter was, um, went to the Statue of Liberty. It opened up. We went inside the Statue of Liberty. And um, we were able to answer the question that she kept asking me over and over again. Who was the face of the stat on Statue of Liberty? We found out that the face of the Statue of Liberty was the um, sculptor's mother. You know, if you don't know if, what face to use, either use your wife's or use your mother's or use your daughter's, and you got yourself covered. Then we went down to um, Fort McHenry and went through that area. They were memorized by that. Then we went down to D.C., the White House, Lincoln. <clears throat> it, she was, both, I gave both of them cameras. They were just taking pictures like crazy. They were... <clears throat> They were so excited to be standing where Lincoln was, just standing underneath him, looking at his face. And you know, went to the Washington Monument, the White House. Um, as um, <clears throat> my daughter is, my granddaughter is, well, she's nine years old today. And um, we went to the Vietnam Memorial. We went to the Korean War Memorial. And <clears throat> you could see the look on their face because if you've been to the um, the Korean War Memorial, where you actually see basically is on the soldiers, combat infantry on the night patrol, and you can see the anguish, the tension, the fear in their face as they're on night patrol, and it's cold. They got their ponchos on, so you know it's a it's a cold rain. And <clears throat> even as an eight-year-old and a six-year-old, they could sense there was something. Um, about that Korean War monument that, that moved them. Then I went, we went over to the Vietnam Memorial and um, <clears throat> she was looking at it and um, we were going through the, the book and she was looking at all the Robertses that were on that, that list, all the Robertses that died in, in Vietnam. And she goes, well, Papa, I'm glad your name's not on that list. And I said, yep, Zoe. <laughs> I'm really glad my name's not on the list because we wouldn't um, be here. But she was, um, she could sense the, the emotion, the pain that the people were feeling as they were walking up and down the um, Vietnam Memorial. And um, <clears throat> if you ever get a chance, go to Korean War um, Memorial, go to the Vietnam War Memorial. Those are one of the few things that actually I think have feeling, have emotion. <clears throat> if you go in there without emotion, it'll find a way to draw out that hidden emotion with you because Vietnam ended <clears throat> in 1970, I think it was April of 1973 was the last combat troops um, left um, Vietnam. I think the fall of Saigon was in 1975 where we still get the pictures of the uh, Marines um, getting on that last chopper leaving um, Vietnam. So 25, that's 38 years ago. Vietnam is still in the memory of a lot of people. People still know people who got killed in Vietnam, wounded in Vietnam. Um, <clears throat> I still have a friend, Ricky Rodriguez. He got killed in Vietnam. He got drafted. He, he was in the Army. He went through. He got his orders to Vietnam. He went home on leave. And then he went UA for about 30 days. <clears throat> he finally went back and um, <clears throat> he went back to his unit. He was shipped to Vietnam and he was killed two weeks before he was scheduled to come home. And the ironic part is, and you know, you never know how it could have played out, was when he got killed two weeks before he was supposed to leave, if he hadn't been UA, he would have been home for, for two weeks. He would have been home two weeks earlier before, but you never know. He, something could have happened prior or whatever, but it's just one of those things that play 
back of your mind is what if, what if, and it's kind of like, yep, he got, for an example, he got killed on September 15th, that's, and he was supposed to be home August 31st. So here it is, it's been a, a long time, and um, <clears throat> basically, it still has an effect on me because he's a good friend. I still think of some of the things that he, he used to do. And, um, and so that's why the Vietnam War Memorial has a, a lot of emotion because both the Korean War, um, War Memorial and the Vietnam War Memorial, they're about people. They're not about politicians. They're about people. They're about people who suffered. They're about people who sacrificed. And they're about families who are still enduring the pain of lost um, loved ones. And so <clears throat> then we went down to Jamestown, Pocahontas, and uh, <clears throat> went to another number of other places. We went to um, Guilford Fort battlefield down there, a brutal um, war, <clears throat> brutal battle. We went down to Martin Luther King's uh, memorial, historical site. That's the fourth time I've um, <clears throat> been there. Um, this was the first time I brought my um, the, the granddaughter and two of my other grandsons. So basically I've been there with my granddaughter and I've been there with four of my grandsons. And um, again, it's, it's an they keep changing it, but it's still extremely um, powerful. <clears throat> Excuse me. When they went and sat there quietly looking at the hearse that Martin Luther King was carried through in his state um, funeral, the old wooden, um, <clears throat> basically, um, wagon, a buggy. He was put in the back, nothing fancy. It was someone, a man who was 38, 39 years old, shot down in the prime of his life, who was willing to stand up for convictions and who was willing to die for convictions. One of the things you learn with Martin Luther King is you have no convictions unless you're willing to die for them. And if you're unwilling to die for them, they may be just what is going to benefit you politically. And... Um, Again, so I had an eight-year-old grandson, I had an eight-year-old granddaughter, and I had a six-year-old um, grandson. <clears throat> they understood it. It's really amazing. Kids understand it. Kids are not corrupt. We as adults will end up corrupting the kids, but they understood it. They wanted to go in and sit on the stairs of Martin Luther King's house. They stood on, sat on the stairs with Martin Luther King's house where they go, Papa, Martin Luther King used to sit here as a boy, right? And they go, yeah, I go, yes. Then we went into um, the church and they sat, they looked in the church and they sat all the way in the back and then they sat on the side. <clears throat> then they go and say, how come the clock isn't moving? And you go in and say, that's the time of his funeral. That's the time. Basically, and that church, <clears throat> as far as the church is concerned, time stood still for Martin Luther King, but as far as Martin Luther King was concerned, time moves on, time waits for no man, and time, we got to use time to, to make changes. So we went through that, we went through the internal flame. So again, that's the summer that um, my two granddaughters had. <clears throat> they want to go. We went to, yes, um, shoot, shoot. <clears throat> we went to another one that I can't even think of. Um, William, not Doug, William Douglas. Um, Douglas, Douglas, Douglas. I'll think of the name later. Frederick Douglas. We went to Frederick Douglas' um, house. And again, um, <clears throat> they saw the movie with uh, about a 15, 20 mo minute movie talking about Harriet Tudman and other ones. Harriet Tubman, a black lady who became <clears throat> free. She was also a nurse. She was also a spy for the Union forces. She came up, some of the things that have happened right now in nursing was the result of Harriet Tubman. Because yes, there was <clears throat> Union commanders who wanted to use um, the slaves to go against the rebels for two reasons. One, because 
the rebels viewed slaves as property, so if you took the, them away, they couldn't help the rebels' war cause. So then, but then if you use the slaves against the, um, the rebels, that would then increase your military power. But what happened was that, um, unfortunately, if you get killed or you got wounded, especially if you got wounded, there wasn't a lot of the, um, the black Union soldiers ended up dying as a result of their wounds because of totally unsanitary conditions and all this other kind of stuff. So what she did is she worked to improve, as a nurse, she worked to improve the quality and the hygienic, hygienic and other stuff in the, um, the black hospitals because still back then a lot of the hospitals were, were segregated. And so she saved a lot of black Union soldiers' lives through her action. But another thing that um, Harriet Tugman did, which I felt was extremely important, which was a powerful lesson, and we do it today, and what she went and said when she worked with the Underground Railroad, she said, I can't save everybody. Okay, but I'm not going to use that as an excuse not to save anybody. If I can only save two or three people, two, if I can only take two or three slaves this time on this trip and bring them to freedom, so be it. That is all I can do. I'm not going to feel guilty about leaving anybody behind. That's all I can do. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take what I can and hope that soon, sometime soon, that I will bring enough out to freedom that they will be able to contribute so everyone becomes free. And to me, that was really critical because in education and in sports and a lot of things right now, we go and tell people, you know what? If I can't help everybody, I'm not going to help anybody at all. And I went to a lot of... Um, Three, three, I've been four um, education conferences already this year. And the thing that was irritating me over and over again was, well, it ain't fair because we can't help anybody. That is one of the worst cop-outs of all. Because we can't help anybody, we're going to screw everybody. No. Plain and simple, you help what you can, and you expect them and hope that they will pay it forward and they become multipliers. Again, my eight-year-old granddaughter got that. And I just hope that my grandkids maintain that childlike view of the world because I think if they maintain that childlike view of the world, the world would be a much better place because kids get it. We as adults do our best to ensure that we shut down children. <clears throat> okay. That's what I did with my um, <clears throat> two granddaughters. Then came back, went to a, a conference out in Chicago, and um, <clears throat> had a really good time. Went to um, a number of museums along the way, the Cleveland Museum, the Cleveland um, Museum of Natural History, the Museum in Detroit, the um, Chicago Art Institute, and, and a few other, um, the Planetarium, and a few other museums, and it was unbelievable and I saw more Picassos, more Rembrandts and uh, more Rembrandts and I got close, I get really close and I'm, I, you know, I go, yep, yep, I know I'm an adult but maybe I can touch the, um, <clears throat> a Picasso or a Rembrandt and say I've touched it but you know, it got the better of me and I says no, no because in some of the places you get within six to nine inches and all the bells and whistles go off. I said, no, nah, no, nah, I better not get caught doing that. Last thing I want to do is get thrown in jail for uh, touching a Rembrandt. It ain't going to do me any good to say, why are you in jail? Because I touched a Rembrandt. <clears throat> then I came, um, came back and I took my two grandsons, Christian and Xavier, and um, we stopped at a number of um, national parks, and then we went to three, three new ones for them, and then we went to the Baseball um, Hall of Fame. And... <clears throat> They, again, they were impressed by that. They were looking at the um, Jackie Robinson, all the stuff that Jackie Robinson did, the stuff that um, Hank Aaron had to endure as he was um, 
going after Babe Ruth's home run record, the racism, the threats, all kind of stuff. But Hank Aaron, being a man, a man of character, went to work every day, did what he was supposed to do, and he did not let people um, prevent him from doing what he needed to do or he wanted to do. <clears throat> then we looked at the, um, the Negro League, and you're going in, and um, it, my grandson goes, well, Papa, how come all those um, black people are in Major League Baseball? And uh, I thought Jackie Robinson was in um, the first in Major League Baseball. And the answer was no. Again, how we just start history. There used to be blacks in Major League Baseball until Major League Baseball got a commissioner, and the commissioner basically said there'd be no more blacks in um, Major League Baseball. And so we tend to go and say, yes, there was um, blacks in, in Major League Baseball, but the baseball got a bigoted commissioner, and then he prevented um, blacks from um, playing. And then Jackie Robinson came. Yes, <clears throat> for a long time, quote unquote, there weren't blacks in um, Major League Baseball. But if you really want to be honest with it, there were blacks in Major League Baseball. <clears throat> it was kind of like in, in South Africa. Basically, you're black if you can't pass the um, pencil test. Basically, you put... Um, <clears throat> Your finger, uh, you put a pencil in your hair. If you, the pencil doesn't fall out, you're black. If you, your lips are too big, you're black. Weird rules. Major League Baseball did the same thing. <clears throat> the Army did the same thing. So if you were light-skinned enough and you had um, <clears throat> straight enough hair and, and some of the other stuff, you weren't black. You were Greek, you were Italian, you were Spanish. You were Indian, so there was always ways to, to get around it. And so you had people who wanted to play Major League Baseball, who wanted to be Army officers. They did it. They understood the rules. Play, if you come out and say, I'm black, you can't play, you're automatically off. And so when you go into the Hall of Fame, you'll see some of these people, the forgetting people, but the people that set the ground rules. They built the foundation. They built the foundation so you could have a Jackie Robinson. So it's kind of like <clears throat> all these people did the planning, they did the work, they did the testing to give Jackie Robinson the opportunity to go to the moon. Yes, going to the moon was scary, and it takes hard work. <clears throat> but what it shows is every success is built on the shoulders of a lot of unknown people. And also, again, when we were straightening it out and you're looking at it, the, um, <clears throat> they were talking about um, why we want to have blacks into um, Major League Baseball. Well, a couple of the news articles and, and some of the, the letters basically said, okay, but again, this takes away from the fairy tale. They says, you know what? We are losing too much money by not having black fans come to white ball fields. <clears throat> the black fans are going to the Negro Leagues. The black fans are going and watching, um, <clears throat> if a, bon a Negro team bond storms and goes to Fenway Park, Fenway Park is jam-packed with black um, fans. And they basically said, there is too much money being lost. And, and some of the people and the owners of the Negro League said, hey, you know what? Major League Baseball will work with you, and, but we would like to be a minor league, like a triple-A um, league, and then we can help. <clears throat> we can come up with black back um, baseball players and other stuff go along. And everything seemed to go right. Bingo. The, the black athletes would be, baseball players would be brought up, brought up the cream of the crop. And basically, but the Negro League was, was sold out. They weren't, um, they never became a minor league team. Major League Baseball viewed them as a competitor. Major League Baseball took their best people, and basically the Negro League disappeared from existence. 
those are some of the things you do when you go to when when you go to national parks, you go to museums and stuff. And so that's what I did this summer with um, <clears throat> my grandchildren, and they had a great time. And that's we, we don't talk about Xbox or PlayStation or whatever. They'll still come up and ask me questions about this or questions about that. We've got thousands of pictures that they come over to the house and look at. They all want a National Park um, book. So what we're doing is we're putting the pictures and other stuff together. So they'll have a, a National Park um, collection book. And so when they go in and talk to their friends and they go and say, hey, what did you do this summer? Nope. This is what we did this summer. We went to the national parks. So <clears throat> basically right now, I have 179 national parks under my belt. Um, two of my grandsons have 18. My, one of my granddaughter has 16, and the other one has 11. And the uh, two other ones, we ha have two. So that's what I did this summer um, <clears throat> to me. Basically, um, 10 months out of the year, from September to um, June, I'll bust my hump. I'll do what's necessary for the school board and the city council and the state house and the county. But um, every summer, I've decided, June, July, I mean July and August, July and August um, <clears throat> belongs to me, belongs to my family, and especially um, belongs to uh, my grandchildren. I, I've learned a lot, and I want them to learn as much as possible. I want them to be as knowledgeable as possible, and you don't gain knowledge unless you go and travel. <clears throat> I think it was Henry um, Thoreau or um, Mark Twain, one of them um, <clears throat> basically said, you can't end bigotry unless you travel, because if you stay home and just watch TV, or watch the newspaper, um, you're in your little old cocoon and you're listening to the same people <clears throat> and that helps you maintain the same ideas you have. Again, I've traveled around the country a lot this year. I've met a heck of a lot more people and I know I'm not the same person I was two months ago. I've picked up a lot of knowledge. I've read a heck of a lot of books. I've seen places. And the thing goes, every time you have a new experience, you meet a new person, it has an effect on you. Sometimes good, sometimes bad. But the question is, is are you going to be strong enough to um, say, you know what? I was wrong. I have new information. And because I have new information, I was wrong. And I have to look at something um, differently. So... That's enough for um, what I've done in the last um, <clears throat> two months, and hopefully the reruns that they picked weren't that bad. But um, so this show is the start of um, the fifth season. So this will be five zero one or five one zero one, however they they do it. And <clears throat> we're getting pretty close to about the hundred and fiftieth show. I'd have to look that up, but that's what it's going to be. And um, the show will air when you're on September 11th, and um, pretty important um, day. And <clears throat> one of the two things on September 11th, I took two of my grandsons. We went to the September 11th um, memorial, and um, the museum was supposed to open up, but it's not going to open up on um, September 11th. There is... Um, petty BS between a, a bunch of the people, the contractors, and who's going to get political points. So basically what happens is I've heard it's been delayed for a couple of months, minimum of a couple of months. And so <clears throat> basically, again, because pettiness and all this kind of stuff, a lot of people are going to be lose the opportunity to go to a museum <clears throat> in um, two days and forever. And so, well, not forever but over the next couple of months. So again, but that's part of, uh, of the pettiness that's um, going around. <clears throat> so what I'm going to do now is we're going to get into some uh, things that I think is quite serious. And um, 
We have um, the, the president and John Kerry seem to be, we got to go to to war. We have to have a limited um, attack on Syria. And the reason we have to have a limited attack on Syria, because it has to do with the president's credibility. It has to do with the credibility of the United States. <clears throat> okay. As someone who spent 21 years in the Marine Corps, as an officer, okay, when I take, I serve as an officer as the, at the pleasure of the United, of the, of the President of the United States, but my loyalty is not to no person. My loyalty, I swear loyalty to my country, and I swear loyalty to the Constitution. And, and so, I, as a military officer, I don't worry about the president's credibility. To me, I don't worry about my boss's credibility. My boss's credibility is his or her own responsibility. Subordinates are not responsible for the boss's credibility. The boss must be responsible for his or her own credibility. So <clears throat> we're in a position now, we're saying we want young men and women, young American men and women to put their lives on the line because it's the president's credibility is on the line? No, that is not leadership. That has nothing to do with credibility. Credibility comes and stands is, this is what I'm going to do, and if it happens, this is what I'm going to do. You can't bluff and have credibility. When you go and tell someone, this is what you're going to do, you do it. If you fail to do it, <clears throat> and you don't have a just, good justification for it, it's you who is responsibility, responsible for your own credibility. You can lose your own credibility. I can't give anybody credibility. I can't protect anybody's credibility. The only way I can really protect anybody's credibility is to lie for them to cover up stuff. And I'm not lying for anybody. I'm not covering up anybody. If you're credible, you're credible. People know if you're credible. And what's happening now in the United States, when so many people say, no, let's not go into Syria, People have lost credibility going around talking to people all, all over the country. Well, this time I didn't go past the Mississippi. People do not have, have trust with their government. When you go Edward Snowden, the NSA, the IRS, Benghazi, we're going over and over again, and we're saying, wait a minute, am I, as an American voter, Am I stupid or does my political leadership say, worry, we can tell him or her whatever we want because they're so stupid, they're going to listen to us. Wait a minute. Benghazi. Okay. Wait a minute. It doesn't make sense. Where are the Marines in Benghazi? Then we find out Benghazi is the only embassy that doesn't have Marines in there. Something's wrong here. Why ain't people going in? Why ain't drones going in? We've got stuff flying over, okay? Why were the talking points changed? There was something wrong. Me, <clears throat> I had been reading a lot, and I looked at the ambassador before he was an ambassador, and all the stuff said the ambassador was running arms. They were getting arms from Libya, and they were running arms from Libya to the rebels in Syria. <clears throat> so the Syrians, quote unquote, it was kind of like um, Iran Contra with Reagan and Ali North in 1986, Admiral Poindexter. We're not giving the Syrians arms. We're just taking the arms the, that we're getting from Libya or buying from Libya, and we're running them over to Syria. So Syria is using the arms. The Syrian rebels are using the arms. And so. <clears throat> All of a sudden, to me, I'm going, wait a minute. We did not want to get caught. We didn't want to get embarrassed. 
And so as people in the military know, <clears throat> those four individuals became expendable because they didn't fit into the big picture. <clears throat> and so when you go in the NSA, <clears throat> now it goes, well, it's no big deal. Well, now it goes, the NSA is going into medical records. They're going into your business records. NSA is cracking all the um, crypto equipment that you're putting on your stuff. Basically, the NSA is tracking um, phone calls. And they go, well, it's in a big collective. Well, you know what? A big collective? Just think, look at it this way. If Edward Snowden did this, and he was only a temporary worker, and he didn't work that much, and he took all this information in a short period of time? Now, what happens if I was a bad guy? What happens if I go in for one of these companies, and I go, wait a minute, let me get all this credit card information. Let me get all this health stuff. Maybe I go put it on a jump drive. I saw a jump drive right now at, at Staples, 128 gigs. You know how much information that is? 128 gigs on something that small. I could go into work every single day and take something that small. I can hide that on different parts of my body as I'm going in and out. And then I would now have the ability to go individually. Okay, yes, here's Chris Roberts. Chris Roberts does this. This is the website Chris Roberts goes on. This is who Chris Roberts talks to. This is what Chris Roberts buys then I can now create, I could profile Chris Roberts, and then I could then predict what Chris Roberts is going to do. And to go and say, no, nope, that's not going to happen because every single outside contractor that we hire is totally loyal to the government. No, those outside contractors are there to make money. And so that's what's happening. So that's at risk to go and say we have this pool of information and no one is going to touch it for illegal reasons. So, so when you go in and the IRS and go, wait a minute, I don't know, it ain't, it ain't adding up. The American people have lost trust with their government. And it is serious trust. And we've been beating around the bush, and no pun intended, President Bush is long gone. He's five years gone. He's probably one of the happiest presidents there are right now because I'm no longer president of the United States. I'm not. Re you, you can keep blaming me, but I don't have to go in front of the press. Well, <clears throat> here's a couple of supporters from um, <clears throat> President Obama. <clears throat> Ed Asner, former head of the, um, the Actors Guild, in um, California, top notch, 82 years old, total um, supporter in Obama. And he goes, <clears throat> I voted for him, but I'm not proud. He hasn't thrown himself on the funeral pile. I wanted him to sacrifice himself. Instead, he has proven himself to be a corporist. And as long as he's a corporist, He's not my president. A lot of people have lost hope with the betrayal, the NIS spying. People aren't getting, <clears throat> aren't getting active because who gives a poop? It's essentially the bottom line. He's saying, hey, Mr. President, I supported you. I raised millions of dollars for you. But I'm not proud of my vote. Ed Asner goes, it says, whether it's a Republican or Democratic president, a Republican or Democratic Congress, and it doesn't make a goddamn if it behooves us, the goddamn if it behooves us to get off our butts and ask these questions. Here's again, we're not um, asking questions. So what they did was <clears throat> they asked Ed Asner, how come people are not asking questions? How come people are not challenging the president? How come all the people in Hawaii, I mean Hollywood, <clears throat> that um, supported the president are not saying anything? He's lost Ed Nasda, he's lost um, Farrell, he's lost Matt Damon. And his answer was quite shocking. And he goes, a lot of people don't want to say what the... Don't, don't say what they want because they don't want to feel any black by being opposed to President Obama. And there's the fear. 
Basically, people go and say, if I criticize the president, it has to do with race. It has nothing to do with race. It's all about Martin Luther King. Martin Luther King says we be judged by the content of our character, not about our race, not about our sex. President Obama is the president of the United States. He should be, if we are right, if we live up to Martin Luther King's dreams, he should be judged against Abraham Lincoln, Harry Truman, Teddy Roosevelt, John Kennedy. Those are what the people, those are <clears throat> George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, Andrew Jackson. Those are the presidents, former presidents of the United States. Those are the people Barack Obama should be judged against. It has should nothing to do with his sex, nothing to do with his age, nothing to do with his color. He's the president of the United States, and he needs to be judged by the other 43 presidents of the United States. That's who he should be judged by. <clears throat> and um, he isn't. And so let's stop worrying about what color he is, what religion he is. Well, people hated John Kennedy because he was a Catholic. John Kennedy says, hey, I'm the president of the United States. I'm not a Catholic. I'm just a president of the United States who happens to be Catholic. Okay, judge me as the president. Plain and simple, we as the people have to judge President Obama as the, um, <clears throat> the president. Okay, so getting all that out, we're going to talk about um, Syria. And um, about three years ago in the Keen Sentinel, I wrote a piece um, saying that it was going to take come up 700 words, a commentary saying it would take political courage to get out of Afghanistan. And I wrote one a couple of days ago. I don't know if it's going to make it in the um, paper or not. <clears throat> but I basically saying is we've really lost, especially Senator um, Secretary of State, John Kerry has really lost all credibility when it comes to um, Syria. When he's going in and saying Syria, Syria's used chemical weapons and um, we have to do something. Well, part of the thing that ticked me off was <clears throat> John Kerry, a Vietnam veteran, knew that we used Agent Orange <clears throat> in Vietnam. Well, Agent Orange and herbicides are considered chemical weapons, okay? But when they go and don't put the rest of the story in, <clears throat> the ban, the 1929 protocol, I think it's 1929, or 1925, 1929, well, I, th I think it might be 1925. We, the United States, did not sign that ban until 1975. We signed it saying, in 1975, after we were done with Vietnam, after we had um, dumped thousands of tons of Agent Orange and other um, dioxins and other herbicides on Agent Orange, which has killed thousands of American servicemen who served in Vietnam, who has uh, had horrible effects on <clears throat> tens of thousands unknown American veterans in their family, their children, children still being born with spina bifida, other problems, children who never went to Vietnam, who are now suffering because of Agent Orange. This is not counting any of the people that were in Vietnam, none of the Vietnam citizens, none of the Korean citizens, none of the Japanese citizens in Okinawa, because we really don't count those, but we use chemical weapons. But we go and say, <clears throat> we didn't use them illegally because we were not party to the um, Geneva Convention protocol. Again, that's playing games because we used it up. And then when the United States signed the protocol, it didn't ban the use of chemical weapons. We just said we wouldn't use them first we retain the right to use chemical weapons. The second part, if you read it, the ban is only against using chemical weapons in an international conflict. <clears throat> there is nothing in the original one 
in the protocol that says you can't use chemical weapons in your own country. <clears throat> you cannot use chemical weapons in <clears throat> a civil war, okay? The moral part of it, the ethical part, that's something totally different. But on the legal part, <clears throat> Syria, like the United States, <clears throat> did not sign <clears throat> Syria, United States, Japan, and a couple other countries said, hey, we retain the right to use chemical weapons if we are attacked. Okay, <clears throat> But again, Senator Kerry, uh, Secretary Kerry, is not saying that. Okay, we in the United States, okay, and there's a 1993 protocol which banned a bunch of stuff, but Syria never signed that protocol. And so what we're doing right now is saying, we're only saying part of the story, putting the pieces together as justification to go into Syria. And there may be a moral justification, there may be an ethical justification, but right now, there is really serious questions about whether um, there is a legal justification for the United States to go into Syria. Second part is what really got me, and I put it in the, um, <clears throat> the, the article that I sent to um, the King Sentinel was, <clears throat> we've been told that the United States knew what our satellites uh, human intelligence, uh, communications intercept, we knew basically up to three days by some report that the Syrians were loading up <clears throat> this, the chemical weapons on missiles, okay, and that they were getting ready to fire. This is, as an NBC officer, someone who's trained in nuclear, biological, and chemical warfare, this is where the ethical question comes in. If I'm the president of the United States and I know that the Syrians, whether it's a rogue part or it's a Syrian country, is getting ready to launch um, a chemical weapons 72 hours in advance, me, if I'm president of the United States, I go and say, Mr. Assad, I know what you're doing and I'm telling the world what you're doing and I'm telling the world the minute you launch that missile, you're getting cruise missiles for breakfast. No ifs, ands, and buts. This is your warning. We know it. And I would, here's the pictures. Here's the satellites. Here's the communications. We know that you're doing it. You're loading it. And the minute you fire, we fire. Because <clears throat> United States and Israel fired two missiles the other day as a missile test in um, the Mediterranean. Within minutes of those missiles, the Russians notified the world those missiles were fired and where they were fired from. We have the sophistication. We knew where they were coming from. So to me, this, uh, legally we don't have to tell anybody, but as an ethical and moral thing, if I know that you are going to launch chemical weapons and I want to go to war with you, so I do nothing, and I go and allow 1,400, 1,500, some people say 300, 1,500. The number of children, it was, 420, it was 1,429 children, 426, but the number is creeping up on uh, MSNBC. They're saying 500. I don't know where they get their roundup factor. You, to me, when I went to school, it's down to 400 because it's 426. They're rounding up the numbers. What we're saying is we... The people of the United States knew that they were, if we say, we're, if we're being honest, we knew that this was going to happen and we did nothing and 426 children were killed in a gas attack that we knew 72 hours in advance and we allowed it to happen because we want to have a legal justification which we probably won't, but we want a moral or an ethical justification. We want the opportunity for the president of the United States to maintain his credibility so we did nothing. Who is morally and ethically wrong on this? Are we because we could have saved those 426 kids' lives? Kids, children don't pick sides in wars. Adults pick sides. The adults made those decisions. 
And so they if they die from a gas attack, we may not have blood on our hands, but we have death on our hands because we could have possibly prevented it. And what better if you're going to do something, Saad, um, Saad, we know you're going to do it. And we got our warships. We're there. We're watching you. We've got drones flying over. The minute that goes, our cruise missiles, they're already warmed up. They're ready to go. And all I do is say, execute. The president executes those missiles before your missiles are finished launching. American Tomahawk cruise missiles are in your backyard. Those missiles are taking out those um, missile launches, and I'd put a couple of them right into your palace to show you we're not playing games. I'm not bluffing. But instead, we're trying to do everything possible to twist to get people into, um, to get into the war. Why? For our credibility, the president's credibility. Well, I'm going to say a couple of things. I've got my little two iPads here because we're going to try to go some high tech. We get this going. And this was from um, September 16th, uh, December 17, 2011. In strikes on Libya by NATO, an unspoken civilian toll. We're told over and over again, we can do surgical strikes, precision strikes. We know what we're getting at. There is no errors. You don't have to worry about it. <clears throat> By NATO telling during the war, in a statement since Saudis ended on October 31st, the alliance-led operation was nearly flawless. A model air war that used high technology, meticulously planning, and restraint to protect civilians from Colonel Gaddafi's troops, which was the alliance mandate. Okay. <clears throat> yes, the alliance mandate was to protect civilians from Gaddafi's troops. <clears throat> okay. But one thing that happened over here. NATO warplanes flew thousands of Saudis and dropped 7,700 bombs or missiles be because the time did not examine sites in several cities and towns where the air campaign was active. Casualties estimates could be low. <clears throat> NATO experience in Libya also reviewed an attitude that initially prevailed in Afghanistan. There, NATO forces led by the United States tightened the rules of engagement for airstrikes and insisted on better targeting to reduce civilian deaths only after repeatedly ignoring or disputing accounts of airstrikes that left many civilians um, dead. How many times over and over again, the Washington Post, the New York Times, the Boston Globe, the LA Times, any time someone said people got killed, civilians were killed, we would go and say, you know what? Those numbers are fabricated. Or no, they put civilians in front of the targets. All that, they came up with all kinds of excuses. <clears throat> While the overwhelming preponderance of strikes seem to have hit their targets without killing non-combatants, many factors considered a run, <clears throat> contribute to a run of fa fatal mistakes. They're including a techn technically faulty bomb, poor or dated intelligence, and near absence of experienced military personnel on the ground who could direct help direct air attacks. Faulty intelligence. We're told over and over again there is no such thing as faulty intelligence. Hey, it only took us 10 years in uh, Iraq to realize maybe there was some faulty intelligence. Yes, there was plenty of weapons of mass destruction. Now we're being told that maybe Saddam sent all his weapons of mass destruction over to um, Syria, so we may have to go to Syria to take out those weapons of mass destruction. Or maybe the Iraqis will welcome us in open arms. Didn't happen. The alliance apparent presumption that the reside brought to harbor pro-Gaddafi forces were not occupied by civilian repeatedly proved, proved mistaken. The evidence suggests is proposing a reminder in the advocates of air power that no war is cost or air free. And <clears throat> Seven months later, the alliance had destroyed more than 5,900 military targets by means of 9,700 Saudi strikes, according to this data. <clears throat> France carried out a third of all strikes, Britain 21, and the United States basically 19. <clears throat> 
So basically what we're not really told, but if you look at the numbers, the United States launched over two, basically 2,000 Saudis in the um, Libyan war, quote, the Libyan conflict, which was supposed to protect civilians. But it destroyed um, 5,900 military targets. Basically, what happened was we were supposed to protect civilians, and in fact, we became the rebels air force and close armed support. Many early strikes were planned missions, but about two-thirds of all strikes, basically pretty close to 6,500, and most of the attacks later in the war were another sort, dynamic strikes. Another cold word is a dynamic strike is a strike of opportunity. If you think something is um, an enemy, go fire, blow it up, ask questions later, or we'll look at the film. And you know what? It's too quick. You have to be um, no, nothing planned. And the guy goes, only once we had a clear shot would we take it. <clears throat> and it goes and lists the number of people, um, civilians that got killed. Then it backtracked, you know, director of field operations for civics, the victims group, explained, examined the site and delivered her finding to NATO. She met with a code response. They said, we have no confirmed reports of civilian casualties. How many times over and over again, no confirmed reports? Well, you know what? If you're dead, you're dead. And the reason she said was the alliance had created its own definition for confirmed. Only a death that NATO itself investigated and corroborated could be called confirmed. But because the alliance declined to investigate allegations, its casualty total by definition could not be budged from zero. Again, if we investigate and we can confirm, then it's confirmed. But if we choose not to investigate, there are no confirmed casualties. We're not lying. We're just saying is we have no confirmed um, casualties. <clears throat> the um, not a great fan of Denny Kucinovich, but if you go on uh, Google and ask for a top 10 unproven claims for war against Syria by Denny Kucinovich, First one, the administration claims a civilian weapon was used. The UN inspectors are still completing their independent um, valuation. Who from the United States was responsible for chain of custody? Where was the laboratory analysis conducted? That was a couple of questions that I had in my um, letter. Are, are you speaking of a specific group or all groups working into Syria to overthrow President Assad? Chemical weapons have been used. Who used them? Has both sides used them? There's reports from the UN that says the Syrian rebels have used chemical weapons. And symptoms of um, Syrian or, um, well, there's a different, we all have symptoms and um, indicators of different chemical weapons in our system. You have to have a background excuse me, level to determine when it's above that certain point. The administration claimed intelligence that Assad's brother ordered the attack. What is the type and source of intelligence alleged that Assad's brother personally ordered the attack? Who made the determination that Assad's brother ordered the attack based on what intelligence? Now, the administration claimed poison gas was released in a rocket attack. Who was tracking the rocket and the artillery attack which preceded the poison gas release? One of the questions I had. These events occur simultaneously or consecutively. Could these events, the rocket launch and the release of poison gas, have been conflated? Based on the evidence, is it possible that the rocket attack by Syrian government was aimed at rebels stationed beyond civilians and a chemical attack was launched by rebels against the civilian population an hour and hour and a half later? Explain the 90% 90-minute 90 time interval between the rocket launch and the chemical weapons attack. Has forensic evidence been gathered at the scene of the attack that would confirm the use of rockets to deliver the attack? <clears throat> the administration claimed 1,429 people died in the attack. Secretary Kerry claimed 1,429, including 426 children. From whom did that number first originate? <clears throat> The, the administration has made repeated reference to video and photos of the attack as basins for military action. Where and where were the videos taken after the Atmac did poison gas attack? <clears throat> the administration claimed, I only got a minute and a half, so 
The administration claimed the key intercept proved that Assad's regime really complicity in the chemical weapons attack. Will you release the original transcript and the language in which it was recorded, as well as translations replied upon to determine the nation of the correspondent allegedly accepted? What is the source of this transcript? Was it the exact time of the intercept? Was it a United States intercept or supply from a non-U.S. source? Because, again, in Iraq, we get a lot of information from non-U.S. sources, which proved to be wrong because it was based on their best interests, not us. <clears throat> claim 10. The administration claimed that sustained shelling occurred after the chemical weapon audit in order to cover up the trace of the attack. Please release all intelligent military assessment as to the reason for the sustained shelling when it's reported to have occurred after the chemical attack. Who made the determination that was the intended to cover up a chemical weapon attack, or was it counterattack during the release? How does Shellen make the residue of sarin gas disappear? Well, here it is. If you go and look at the Jap Japanese sarin attack, basically what you can do is you go get tissues, basically brain tissue from dead individuals or from animal caucus, and then you go and use that and you can help determine if it was a Syrian attack. You can't definitely for guarantee 100% or 90% say this is a result of Syrian because they're different type of um, nerve agents, but <clears throat> forensic investigation and studying of the tissue of people and animals that were killed as a result of the attack would be able to tell you whether what type of chemicals were. So again, I don't support the um, anything in Syria. If it happened, it happened, it's bad, but I just don't have trust right now. So again, go look for yourself. Thank you.